much. Just such a lovely welcome and for inviting me to this amazing event. It's an absolute honour to be a part of it and to sit on a panel with these women who are all icons in my eyes. It's also very lovely to be asked to be on a platform when in recent months you've been on the receiving end of a concerted campaign to be silenced and deplatformed. So I thought I would begin by saying a little bit about that. So I've been involved in the world of maternity for over a decade, first as a mum, my eldest is 14 and I have three children, and then as a writer, author and journalist and the founder of the Positive Birth Movement, a global network of support groups for pregnant women. My passion for all this time has been to challenge the negative narrative around women's bodies and encourage the idea that the female body is something that works, something to be proud of. Never that women's horizons should be limited by their biology, but simply that when or if they come to give birth, they should not only have first-class, respectful care, but also have an inbuilt confidence in their bodies and their ability to access their own life-giving power. They should come to the other side of birth empowered rather than traumatised. In more recent times, I've also written about menstruation for preteen girls with the same message. Your female body is interesting. It's something powerful and clever, and it's something to understand, appreciate, and love. Like many of us, the awareness of the effect of gender ideology on the language of female biology crept onto my radar very slowly and gradually. It's been interesting for this talk to retrace my steps somewhat and work out how I became the outspoken turf that sits before you today. <laughs> What interests me particularly about the story when I look back on it is how my own opinion was consistently clouded by other people's misogyny and ageism. The spin that is put on any woman speaking out for women's language and women's rights. They are portrayed at best as old and therefore out of touch, at worst as hateful and bigoted. Uh, special thanks for, to Rupert Grint for illustrating this point really well today. <laughs> described J.K. Rowling as an, his auntie, his sort of slightly embarrassing auntie. Um, often as I rushed through a busy life, I failed to question this narrative, a narrative that is now, of course, used against me. Now I try much harder to make it my habit to consciously notice when women are being discredited in this way, on any topic, and to try to listen to what they are actually saying, rather than what others are saying about them. I think the first time I noticed something controversial was happening was possibly in 2015, when world-famous midwife Ina May Gaskin signed an open letter to MANA, the Midwives Alliance of North America. The letter expressed concern that MANA had erased the word woman from the MANA core competencies document and replaced it with pregnant individual and birthing parent. The letter applauds MANA for their attempts at inclusivity, but raises concerns about prioritising gender identity above biological reality, which the letter authors see as part of a cultural trend to deny material biological reality and further disconnect ourselves from nature and the body. The root of female oppression is derived from biology, they also point out, adding, women have a right to bodily autonomy and to speak about their bodies and lives, without the demand that we couch this self-expression in language which suits the agenda of others who are not born female. It's a brilliant letter, you should look it up. They also talk about female biology, not just as the root of our oppression, but as our life-giving power. They are midwives, remember. <laughs> if women are erased from the language of birth, they argue, women as a class lose recognition of and connection to this power. I must admit that at the time of this letter in 2015, I was absolutely in the thick of it with three children aged about two, five, and seven, and various other stuff going on in my life. And the ideas within it, which resonate so strongly with me now, really felt quite new and alien. Added to this, the dominant narrative was, of course, that Ina May Gaskin was a transphobe and should be cancelled. As a key signatory, in spite of her massive contribution to midwifery, she was clearly now suddenly prejudiced and out of touch with the inclusivity and progressiveness of a new generation. As an old woman, 75 at the time of the letter, her views were no longer relevant. Of course, in 2015, I'd only just turned 40 and was therefore only just on the cusp of becoming relevant myself. <laughs> Over the next few years, I wrote The Positive Birth Book, published in 2017, and Give Birth Like a Feminist, published in 2019. 
In the two years between those two books, there was a shift in the UK world of birth and maternity towards the use of the term birthing people, or women and birthing people. When writing Give Birth Like a Feminist, I debated at length whether or not to use the phrase or to write some kind of disclaimer at the front of the book as to what I meant by the word woman. I'd seen others do this. But something nagged at me. Maybe I'd taken in more of the mana letter than I realised. I eventually decided that a book about sex-based oppression, a book about how women are basically kept from the power of their own biology by a maternity system built by patriarchy, ought to use sex-based language. I stuck to women, and thankfully the publishers did not object. When I was writing Give Birth Like a Feminist, I also accidentally discovered gender-critical Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I read a paper about obstetric violence that referenced a UK paper about the polarised interpretations of the medicalisation of childbirth. I began following the author on Twitter, a feminist philosopher that some of you may have heard of, Jane Claire Jones. <laughs> As I was starting to have my eyes opened by Jane's tweets, Lindsay McCarthy Calvert, who's here tonight, was being ostracised by Dooley UK. Responding to a reference by Cancer Research to everyone with a cervix, Lindsay wrote, I am not a cervix owner, I am not a menstruator, I am not a feeling, I am not defined by wearing a dress and lipstick, I am a woman, an adult human female. Women first. Women birth all the people, make up half the population, but less than a third of the seats in the House of, Common, uh, House of Commons are occupied by us, she wrote. But of course, the prevailing narrative was that Lindsay was bigoted, transphobic, unkind, out of touch. An article uh, from Pink News drew a line of association from Lindsay to Posey Parker to white nationalist extremists. <laughs> and of course, perhaps worse still, she was also over 40. <laughs> I think these negative narratives were quite effective in making me toe the line for as long as I did. Lindsay, Maya, Julie Bindle, J.K. Rowling, Kathleen Stock, Alison Bailey, Raquel Rosario Sanchez, A Woman's Place, Rosie Kay, who is here tonight, I think. <laughs> Somehow you get given the impression that there's something unsavoury here, but you're never quite sure what. So I would reiterate, read the actual words these women say. So what did I say? Well, everyone had a 2020 lockdown project. For some it was wine time Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> Mine became reading everything I could find about gender. I wanted to know why I was supposed to say birthing people and assigned female or male at birth. I asked these questions in birth and midwifery groups, and every time I did, the reaction was off the scale. It was clear these questions were not acceptable. This only spurred me on and made me ever more curious. What happened next, some of you write about. To cut a long story short, in November 2020, I commented on an Instagram post which said, obstetric violence is about power and patriarchy. Birthing people are seen as the fragile sex who need to be kept under patriarchal authority by doctors. So, for obvious reasons, this jarred, and I challenged it. I wrote, it's women who are seen as the fragile sex, etc. And obstetric violence is violence against women. Let's not forget who the oppressed are here, and why. And as some of you know, all hell broke loose. In what can only be described as a social media bin fire, I was called <laughs> violent, a piece of shit, turf, toxic, dangerous, a vile creature, willfully harmful, and more and more and more. And I should add that this was by, I was being called these names by doulas, hypnobirthing practitioners, antenatal teachers, etc. Not random uh, fairies. <laughs> Charity Birthrights made a social media post about inclusivity, which everyone in the world of maternity could immediately identify as being pointed at me. Later that night, as I sat on my sofa in utter shock at what was happening, I received an email from the CEO of Birthrights, effectively saying that they would no longer associate with me. Birthrights and others 
who are similarly ideologically captured, may have uncoupled the word woman from material reality, but I have not. It is not birthing people who are seen as the fragile sex, or as vessels, disposable containers for the next generation, whose feelings and experiences are secondary. It is women. And I am using the word woman in its sexed sense. Female people. The oppression of women in childbirth, and in particular obstetric violence, is sex-based. It happens to women, not because of their gender identity, but because of their sex. As in so many other situations, denying this biological reality and taking away the words to describe it will only enable it to go unchallenged. Female biology is an area we have consistently overlooked. The female body is a mystery, even to so many of us who inhabit one. In a recent survey, only 9% of Brits could label all parts of the vulva. 37% mislabeled the clitoris, and less than half, 46%, knew that women have three holes. In another recent survey, almost half of women didn't know where their cervix was. And don't even ask David Lamy any of these questions. <laughs> In the past 10 to 15 years, social media, for all its ills, has offered an opportunity for women to learn more about their bodies and to share and explore the biological experience of being female. I've been proud to be a part of that. Running the Positive Birth Movement, some of my activism was centred around sharing images of labour and birth that challenged the dominant narrative that women in labour were weak, helpless and in need of rescue. And it used to get me banned from social media. There were a couple of high profile occasions when I was kicked off Facebook for it. Most memorably uh, in November 2014, on the day when Kim Kardashian's bottom was supposed to be breaking the internet. Do you remember that? <laughs> By coincidence, I had shared a picture of a birthing bottom that day and got banned for it. So the opportunity to ask, why are some bottoms acceptable but others not so much, was too tempting. This resulted in a conversation happening around the world about the power of birth and why we, we might want to censor such images. Writing at the time, I pointed out that women needed to see such images precisely because they challenged the standard sterile control managed images of birth and that at the same time, the way the images challenged this status quo was precisely why they were censored. As well as the birth images, women have used social media to share lactation, breastfeeding, pubic hair, period blood, fat, cellulite, miscarriage, baby loss, abortion, and more. All these uniquely female experiences have for so long been completely unspoken and taboo, and so many of the images of them on social media have been taken down and censored and women fought battles for them to be restored and allowed. And yet now, just as that seemed to be somewhat resolved, we have a new censorship. Even the phrase, uniquely female experiences, itself will be problematic to some. We have to watch our words around these topics of women's bodies again. Is this a coincidence? Jermaine Greer. I wasn't sure whether to say, Jermaine Greer, but whether I, you know, people have ambivalent opinions about Jermaine Greer. Um, I happen to be a fan of most of what she says. <laughs> In her book, The Whole Woman, she writes, women are driven through the health system like sheep through a dip. The disease they are being treated for is womanhood. Greer jokes that women spend their entire lives under the doctor. When it comes to birth, many women assume their bodies are not fit for purpose and that they will struggle. But is this true? There's often a setup that occurs. Women are placed into environments that are built without their physiology in mind. In fact, most modern birth rooms are built with the needs of midwives and doctors uppermost. Bright lights so they can see, beds so that they can easily reach. Sterile environments, interruptions, strangers, not what women who are mammals need to produce the hormones of birth. But when placed in this environment, their bodies then don't labour in a straightforward way. And women most often blame themselves and their faulty female physiology. This is yet another kind of victim blaming. Sometimes birth units are built differently with birth pools or double beds, pretty lighting, art on the walls, etc. When I recently praised one such room on social media for being built with female physiology in mind, someone corrected me and told me I should say, 
birth rooms built with birthing people's physiology in mind. But again, this erasure of women from the language, in fact this time it's the word female, not women, they're objecting to, obscures biological reality and removes the words we need to highlight specific female needs. And it sets back the progress of all the women who have been trying for decades to highlight that female physiology is being overlooked and who have been repeatedly pointing out that paying more attention to female physiology would almost certainly dramatically reduce the huge numbers of difficult and traumatic births. At the start of this talk, I described myself as outspoken, a word I like to reclaim because it was used by me by the people who campaigned to have me deplatformed from a conference in New Zealand. There's a barely hidden misogyny in calling me this that slightly amuses me, given the fact that the people doing so think they are the progressive ones who are apparently freeing themselves from the confines of gender. <laughs> It also reminds me of an obstetrician who described women with birth plans as middle-class birthzillas, or of the doctor and writer Adam Kay, who wrote in his book, This Is Going to Hurt, about women with full-colour, laminated plans. He said, two centuries of obstetricians have found no way of predicting the course of a labour, but a certain denomination of floaty-dressed mother seems to think she can manage it easily. Women I've spoken to have been told by their doctors, I am the expert here, or I have delivered hundreds of babies, you have not delivered any. All of the women who report these stories of a birthroom power clash are women like me, educated, articulate, privileged, middle class, floaty dressed sometimes, <laughs> Women like me cause a problem because we have a voice. In Ireland, they've only recently repealed the Eighth Amendment. Many of you will know that this amendment gave the fetus and the mother equal rights under law, and most people primarily understand its effect on abortion law. But this attitude that a woman's rights and autonomy are diminished when she becomes pregnant is played out in maternity care for those women who wish to keep their babies as well as for those who don't. A midwife in a Dublin maternity hospital told me that women with a birth plan there are known as the difficult women. One woman who gave birth there in 2015 said to me, they told me, you will give birth when, how, and where we decide. When I questioned their decisions, they said, clearly someone has to be the voice of your baby since you are not being very rational. Women with a voice are irrational or mad and must be brought under control. And this idea goes far beyond Ireland. One of my neighbours in Somerset was referred to a psychologist because she challenged the advice of her obstetrician. This is a friend of mine. She's not mad. Sometimes husbands or partners are brought in. In one case I've written about, a woman decided to decline routine pregnancy scans and the midwife telephoned her husband. I felt this was a huge breach of my privacy and it made me feel like a child, she said. Another woman reported being asked by her doctor, What's more important to you, a natural birth or being a mother to your other children? But that the doctor looked pointedly at her husband as he said it. In another case, a woman refused to get out of the birth pool to be examined during labour. Her husband was told to persuade her, which he dutifully did. The woman then experienced an extremely violating vaginal exam, which he had to witness, having been somehow complicit in it. If women cannot be brought to their senses by their husbands, the authorities or the police may be called upon. My book, Give Birth Like a Feminist, is filled with such stories. In Brazil, a woman called Adelia, taken from her house under arrest and made to have a caesarean because the doctors deemed her to be making the wrong decision to have her breech baby vaginally. In the USA, sock puppet accounts infiltrating a free birth group and reporting a woman who had announced she was in labour, the police arrived at her door. Women in the UK who have free birth, that means at home without midwives, facing questioning from social workers and even police. And in Eastern Europe, where women's bodily autonomy in pregnancy is treated with extreme disregard, the story of a woman who gave birth whilst being restrained by police because she refused to follow doctor's orders and give birth on the bed. This is obstetric violence. Like all violence against women, it happens to women not because of their identity, but because of their sex. 
and nowhere is woman's sex more obvious than in labour and birth. Women like me were trying to use our platform to challenge this situation, but now we are being deplatformed and discredited, and quite frankly, distracted from our work if we will not agree that womanhood has no basis in biology. Throw at me all the slurs you wish. Outspoken, turf, middle class, floaty dressed, old, and all the rest of it. I won't deny biological reality, and I won't be stripped of the words I need to describe it. Nor will I be dehumanized by terms such as cervix haver, vagina owner, body with a vagina, or non-man. <laughs> Women need words to describe and challenge the health gap. And we need words to describe our unique female experiences without hesitation or censorship, and to bloody well celebrate them. We will not be silenced.